Hello, everybody. Initializing the live stream. Here we go. Today it is Thursday, the 21st of March, 2024, the spring equinox. Welcome to spring. Is it spring? They say it's spring. Today, we've got a review for you for a mini PC, the Paladin. Now, the Paladin is a unique mini PC in many ways, which I'm looking forward to showing you. I've already taken it out of the box and done all of the updates, and um, uh, it should be a relatively smooth go through here with, with regards to... Um, uh, sometimes when we're live, we get some unexpected events that occur, and I do try at times to plan a little bit ahead, but I do like to keep these videos completely unrehearsed, live, and unscripted. And as a result, sometimes <clears throat> things go unexpected. So I did my best to make sure everything's going to go smoothly. I, I got a good feeling about today's show. Welcome in, friends and members. Uh, let's see. Hello to Mark Gaines, who just contributed 10 pounds. He says, hello, Carrie, Marlena, DG, and everyone in the chat. Welcome in. Welcome in. Also, um, boy, we've got some folks that were in there early on. Andy Kane, happy birthday to our friend Andy Kane. And uh, <clears throat> hello to David Graham and John Williams, Garfield Rupe and Doman 2000. There's our friend Douglas Burchell, George Ferrugia. Arnold Albert and Dustin Fuller, Luke Greenia, two euro from our friend Nick Caffrey, who says, happy vernal equinox, right on, back at you. Alan Linda says hello, as does 3D Everything and Dave Bat, and Mark Baggett, Dwayne Blackwelder, and Eric P. all saying hello. There's David Martinez and Thomas Mac T. Mortant 1210 joins us, as does Gil Garcia. Ben Laird with a two pound contribution says happy birthday to Andy Kane. Enjoy your day. Ben's joining us from Scotland. And Rick Lake says hello. Joining us from Minnesota. There's Choppa, Scott, and Zach Bissoff, as well as Avery Ramstorff and Steve Chappelle. Green Dragon, Dave Bauer. Welcome in everybody for another hopefully informative eye-opening show. Now, as I previously mentioned, we're talking about the Paladin series of mini laptops. Now, some of you haven't heard of Paladin. <clears throat> I know I didn't initially. And one of the benefits, I suppose, if you want to look at it that way, is you don't pay the name brand tax that a lot of name brands carry. You know, you slap the name Apple on something and you can raise the price 35, 40 percent because it's got that name on it. So the smaller brands, the lesser known brands, have to work harder to earn your business or even to just have, just to get your attention to know they exist. And quite often, <clears throat> there's much better value propositions if you're like me and you're looking for the best value. That's always what I'm after. With a few exceptions where I go excess just to show you why you shouldn't, sometimes we'll do an, ex an excess build like that one over there which is ridiculous, over the top, and completely unnecessary for the purpose that it serves. As far as the production, I could use them. I could use this computer for my production. My production doesn't require that much. However, this is also sort of a stage trinket, if you will. It's there to draw attention. It's there to, to maybe be in a thumbnail where somebody might be stopping by and flipping through YouTube channels and they see that and they're like, whoa, what's that? So it's really just kind of bait, if you want to call it that. I would never own a computer like this, me personally. I know Mara, this probably doesn't have enough bling on it for her. She likes the bling. I don't care for it. I think it's uh, a ridiculous waste of time and money, not only to pay for the extra profit that the manufacturers put into the bling, but then the time configuring it and all the extra time cable managing it is just... Uh, the opposite of running a profitable business, unless I had customers lined up wanting to buy stuff like that for me. And I have yet to find any corporation or even any medium-sized business that wouldn't just kick me to the curb if I tried to sell them something like that. So I have a very different perspective coming at this as a working computer technician 
versus the vast majority of YouTube channels that are just enthusiasts. They enjoy tinkering and they enjoy making the videos and they enjoy writing the articles and they represent the vast majority of videos and articles you'll find online. The enthusiasts are the ones overall making the videos and the content. They're not making it for average users. They're making it for other enthusiasts. And so sometimes an average users walk away from those videos thinking they're doing everything wrong and, and they need a bunch of stuff they don't need, whether it's content plates and liquid coolers and, you know, a, a difference of three degrees variance from one case to another. So they got to switch their case or they need Windows Home versus Pro, even though there's really not much difference for most home users that will ever notice a difference other than wasting your time and your money, which is, in my opinion, as a business owner, what enthusiasts do. Enthusiasts waste their time and money. Overall, that's what defines them as enthusiasts. Business owners invest their time and money in order to make a profit, to stay in business. So we have two very different reasons why we do what we do. And one's not better than the other. I just don't think I would know if I were the average user, the difference between watching one YouTube video from an enthusiast and another YouTube video from a professional, unless somebody explained it to me. And that's all I'm doing. I just want you to be able to understand Who's making the content? What's the motivation? Why are they making the content? Some YouTube content creators only make content as commercials for the content. Per the uh, Someone might, might review this when it actually has nothing negative to say. It only goes over all the highlights and it's effectively a 20 minute free commercial or paid commercial from the manufacturer. We don't do that here. It doesn't happen. If I promote any products here, it's because I use them in my business and those products are offering you guys a unique discount. So our friends over at Acronis, Instant House Call, RoboForm and VIP CDK deals, they don't pay me to read a speech or a script. We're putting out a discount specifically for you guys, the viewers, to take advantage of software that I think at full retail price is a great value. I've been using all of these products for years and I stand behind them 100%, which I don't think any other YouTuber does anyway, aside from their own merch. I'm not really pushing my own merch, although I do have some. <clears throat> I'd much rather see you use Acronis for backups, RoboForm for password management, save money on your Windows license and Office license keys. And uh, if you're using remote access, especially if you're doing remote repairs for friends, family, or business, Instant House Calls very inexpensive and very effective at assisting with repair type work. That's it. There's no gimmick. There's no paid commercial. I'm not a media company. I'm a professional computer technician turning on a camera to show you how the business is run. Now, sometimes companies reach out to me and they say, would you mind taking a look at our product? And if their product fits into a category, potentially, that I would recommend it to my customers, then I say, yes, absolutely. And every once in a while, if a product is just fun, just kind of goofy and fun, a novelty, sometimes we'll cover that, but it's just to break up the monotony of how serious things get around here. So whether it's a PC made entirely of Legos that doesn't actually work, but it lights up and looks like a computer, or a way that you can use your landline phone to Bluetooth it to your cell phone, well, it's just fun stuff. It's totally unnecessary. So I'm excited to look at this Peladin because this has a very unique offering and it's very different in many ways from other mini PC manufacturers. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's start by looking at the Amazon page <clears throat> for the Peladin unit. And I will bring that up on the screen here so you can see it. Okay, so the Peladin W04, it's an AMD Ryzen 5 5500U, which is a six core, 12 thread processor. It'll crank up to four gigahertz. It comes with 16 gigs of DDR4 RAM, a 512 gig NVMe uh, storage. It will support triple display output. In other words, three monitors at the same time. It has Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2. It supports DisplayPort 1.4, HDMI 2.0, USB 3.2 and comes with Windows 11 Pro activated. Now, is that the right price? Does that seem right? $240? I mean, Windows 11 Pro is a $200 operating system, so you're getting the rest of the computer for 
Of course, it's not a $200 operating system if you buy it from VIP CD case, but it is if you buy it from Microsoft. So $239, $239, that is right about as cheap as you can go. Anything under $200 is great if you're just looking to stream something to your TV, you know, some kind of streaming box. This feels like <clears throat> it's about $120 under what I would expect it to sell for. I'm just, this is my first reaction to it. And this is just my honest response. I wasn't thinking the price was that low. And with Amazon, you have 30 days to return it if you don't like it for any reason. So there's no risk if you want to try one out and see for yourself. It's got four ratings averaging five stars. I don't like it when I don't see three, two, and one. There's always some crazies. Um, and so when I don't see the crazies, I can only attribute that to the fact that this is not a household name here in the United States. And so therefore they're not uh, getting as many looky-loos. So let's see, uh, we've got everything they're talking about here in their marketing materials about its triple display outputs, fast and efficient operation, powerful gaming experience. I wouldn't call this a gaming computer, but you know, to each their own. It depends on the games you play. I think if you want a gaming computer, you should be uh, spending uh, starting $800 and going up to $2,500. So when we're looking at a $240 computer, um, I think it's a bit of a stretch to call anything under $800 a gaming PC. That's just me personally in March of 2024. <clears throat> but again, it depends on the games you're going to play. You know, League of Legends and World of Warcraft are probably fine on this, but uh, it's really not a gaming PC. Let's be clear. This is a great home PC that would do everything wonderfully, except that, <laughs> I mean, to my standards anyway. So again, these are unscripted and I'm giving you my honest opinion and telling you just the same way I would tell a customer because I don't want an upset customer. And the best way to avoid that is to make sure you set expectations up front. As long as the customer's expectations are met, you're going to have a happy customer every single time. Let's open it up and see what's in the box. All right, we start with an owner's manual here on the WO. This is a, a unique shade of blue. This is pretty interesting. Let me bring this up to the camera so you guys can get a closer look. It's definitely a different color than most minis. <laughs> you can see all the ports we've got on the back to you. Uh, our two USBs, our display port, HDMI, two ethernet ports, a barrel power connector. And up front, we have a clear CMOS button right there. Our headphone, headset jack, microphone jack. We have a type C port. That's gonna be your other video output if you wanted to run three monitors. Two more USB 3s, and then, of course, our big orange power button. What makes this computer so unique, I can just tell you right off the bat, is if you notice right there, it's got a little notch. Right there. If you stick your finger under that notch and lift up, you're inside, ready to do an upgrade. Now, you'll notice there's only one RAM module in there. And you think, why would they just put one in there? Well, that way, here's the logic. If we gave you 16 gigs of RAM and two 8 gig sticks, then you'd have to buy two 16 gig sticks to upgrade it. So their thought was, let's give you a 16 gig stick. And then all you have to do is buy another 16 gig stick, which is cheaper, and then you've got dual channel 32 gig. So whether or not you agree with that, that's the reasoning. And you don't have to buy the same brand, just make sure you get the same uh, speed of RAM that matches this one. You can look at CPU-Z, Something like that will tell you, may even say right on the RAM itself. Uh, we've got what I believe is a Gen 3. We'll double check. NVMe, it's only 512 gig. Most home and business users don't use more than 100 gigs. So, you know, if you want to switch that out, you can certainly switch it out. There doesn't appear to be a second M.2, although I wouldn't expect that at this price range. But that's how easy that is to get into. And then your Wi-Fi adapter, if you wanted to change Wi-Fi out to Wi-Fi 9 whenever that comes out, 
it's usually located right underneath the NVMe drive. So you take out the one screw to take the NVMe out and uh, your Wi-Fi adapter is right there. If you want to replace the NVMe, be sure to get one with a heat sink or move this heat sink over. There's no airflow in the top. That's a problem with a lot of the mini PCs. Um, you know, you've got this, this area right here to mount a two and a half inch drive and all you're doing is cramming more heat. So just because you can, I can't recommend you do that. I think if you want to add more storage, either get a bigger NVMe or go external through USB storage. USB storage is running at 1,000 megabytes per second on external SSDs. I can't imagine why that wouldn't be fast enough. Um, but again, you're looking at a $239 computer. If you're somebody that needs a lot of storage and you want it faster, there's $800 computers that will solve that for you. So do expect, uh, be, be reasonable at what your price point is. You're not getting a Ferrari for $3,000. It's just not gonna work. It's not gonna be a good, it's not gonna be like new and it's not fair to compare it to a brand new Ferrari. It's not reasonable and it's a, it's a very disconnected from reality type attitude. And so when I see comments come in that say, well, it doesn't have this and it doesn't have that, you, if you're expecting that, need to spend more. This wasn't made for you. This was made for the general population to sell the most amount of units based on what most people need, not what you need. They didn't call this the U edition. However, you can upgrade it to a certain extent, but the CPU is going to be soldered on. So if you feel like that CPU is not good enough, if you feel like anything's not good enough, the only way to solve that is to spend more money. That's just the way the world works. It's not unique to mini PCs. It's true across the board. If you don't like uh, the 80% lean hamburger and you, you think there's too much fat in it, so you want 93% lean, it's going to cost you more per pound to get that. It's not the same thing and it's not fair to compare them. I'm just putting it out there for those of you who you know who you are, who always complain nothing's ever good enough and always complain everything's too expensive. So you got to pick one or the other. And so somewhere in there, there's a balance. Somewhere in there, there is a reasonable compromise that meets the needs of the majority of the people. Because as a manufacturer, you want to sell units as much as possible. You don't want to just sell to a certain small percentage of the population that a specific unit would appeal to. The Ferrari doesn't sell that many cars. In fact, Ferrari will make you fight over their cars by establishing before they make it how many people would want to buy it. And then they make one less than that just to ensure that there's a fight to get it. Man, if you're in a marketing position where you can mess with people like that and they're throwing money at you, you didn't start your business that way, right? And maybe one day Peladin will be at a point where they could do that. I hope they don't because that won't be good for the rest of us. But for the rest of us, they're in a position right now where they're, they're looking to expand the name of their brand to make their name more familiar and to introduce better value for the money than the competitors who are better known. That means it's a great opportunity for us to take advantage of great deals like this. So I already know it's a great deal because I've been playing with it a little bit before we did the live video and I've already taken it out of the little plastic bag it was in. You get a power brick just like this and we'll plug this power brick in over here. While I'm doing that, I'll go over what else is in the box. Let's go here. We'll go here. Now, in the box, we've got an HDMI cable. We have a, a Go Faster sticker. We have some screws. Now, these screws would be to mount a two and a half inch drive in under the lid if you wanted to, along with this little ribbon cable that you would also have to attach. I think it's too much heat. I wouldn't do it. Peladin gives it to you. I kind of feel like if they didn't, they could lower the price even more. But it is what it is. And just because it's going to get hot doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be less reliable or cause a problem. As a technician, I wouldn't want to support it that way. I don't want to take your phone calls because you, you took some inexpensive budget item 
and then threw everything you could on it so that it's so weighted down that it now becomes potentially a, a call after call after call support type situation related to all of the all of the modifications you made. And as a result of your modifications, now you're not happy with your purchase. I'm not happy having to support you for free. So my advice is you order it and use it the way it arrives. With one exception, if you want to add or change the NVMe drive or the RAM, that's no big deal, super easy. The other thing we've got here is a Visa mount, and that's to mount this behind your monitor or off the side of a desk or hang it on a wall. Um, and those screws are also in here for this as well. And that's what you get. I like to go faster sticker. Was that a sticker? I think it's a sticker. Pretty weird. All right. Normally we don't get stickers on mini PCs. I need a keyboard and a mouse, so I'll just grab this one right here. Also, a lot of mini PCs are shipping with Windows 11 Home. The fact that this one comes with Pro I find pretty interesting, although pointless again, I didn't... I, I can't see any reason why any normal home user would notice the difference between home and pro. And I would challenge any normal home user to justify to me why, why they think Windows Home Pro is better. If you can answer that question, you're not an average home user. And likely you don't even use those features anyway. You're just trying to make a point. There are differences, but those differences do not apply to people outside of the business world or outside of home lab experimenters and tweet, uh, uh, people that like to play around with the computers and experiment around, you know, um, there's a word for it that eludes me at the moment. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but again, it doesn't represent the vast majority of PC owners. That's what those home enthusiasts, those enthusiast videos here on YouTube and the people writing those articles, those are for people like you that want all that little detail for the rest of them, for the majority of people, there's not much content for them that applies to them other than me. And there's a handful of others, which is so weird that the minority appears to be the majority because they're more likely to make the content. And the majority is not represented here very well here on YouTube or even on the internet because they don't, participate in it in a way that an enthusiast does. So I'm trying to fill that gap. That's the whole point of my channel. So just in case you were wondering, what the heck am I watching? This may not be for you, or it might be the thing you've been looking for this whole time. And I'm hoping it's the latter. Let's go ahead and turn this bad boy on. We've got a blue light that comes on. And we'll go over here to our HDMI input right here, and we'll watch it boot. PC Fishing renews membership, now a member for 22 months. Right on. Thank you for that, PC Fishing. Alan Lindos with $7.77 says, Hello all, been watching real time, so here's my real time fee. <laughs> Thank you for that, Alan. All right. Now, as you can see, I've got a bunch of items on the desktop here or just the results of just some early testing before I went live. Again, I don't want to be blindsided or surprised by anything. Um, might make for a more interesting video, but sometimes it's a little maddening. But we can go up here to see, uh, well, let's do this first. Let's right click on the start menu and we'll go over to prop uh, system, systems. What? And then under system, we can verify that we have Windows 11 Pro. You go up here, you see we've got the AMD Ryzen 5 5500U with the built-in Radeon graphics. Uh, that's its current speed, but it will turbo up. 16 gigs of RAM is installed. If you want the details on the RAM, we would use something like CPU-Z, which is a free download. You could just Google that. And CPU-Z will give us information regarding power consumption, RAM, Motherboard, BIOS, all of that. So somewhere under here, you can see our cache levels or the amount of cache for each type of cache we've got. Four speed, multiplier, bus speed. Um, 
or voltage here. Socket type, which again, these, these CPUs are always soldered in on laptops and uh, mini PCs. Bit of information about the motherboard. We go over to memory, we get all the details on the memory. So if we wanted another stick of memory to double our RAM, we just go over here to SPD. We wanna make sure we get uh, DDR4 3200. And I think as long as you did that from any manufacturer, DDR4 3200, just pop it in there. It should be compatible with what's in there. It's that easy. Now, there have been some issues with um, manufacturers that pre-install Windows, especially the Asian manufacturers. They go through a non-traditional Windows 11 setup. And ignoring all of the icons from VLC players straight down, and Cinebench, if you look at these icons here, user, computer, um, network, recycle bin, control panel, uh, forget that one, that one, that one's something I added. So just these six icons, this is how it arrives after you do your Windows setup. Now, I'm not a fan of this. This is not a traditional Windows setup. And I've scanned it, and there's no viruses or anything on it, but it, it makes me uneasy when I don't get a plain Jane Windows 11 OEM install, then if I had a complaint, it would be don't do this. Put it back the way it's supposed to be out of the box without, you know, modify your mini PC all you want, but leave Windows alone. So we don't have any bloatware, but we've got these weird, not weird, we've got some optional icons that are not defaulted to a Windows 11 install, like the user icon, um, the control panel. And these things and network, these things should not be on the desktop unless the user puts them on there. So that, yeah, I get a little nervous, honestly, when I see that. And there's nothing wrong with it. They haven't done anything wrong, but it makes me nervous. So I'd much rather see a regular clean Windows install and let the user adjust this as the user sees fit. Now, of course, I have my... Uh, Uncle Kerry's Windows 10 optimizer. And I'll add the this PC, which is probably, that one actually probably came from me. Uh, one of the problems with doing this offline and prepping it for the show is, I think there's two icons on here, uh, the user folder, the network shortcut, and the control panel shortcut that are modified to be there, which would not be there. And I don't put them there. I don't want them there. It's not my choice. That's somebody's preference. It wasn't my preference. Whoever did this for Peladin, it was like they ordered something off a menu for you and it's food you don't want or it's too much food or too little food or it's food you don't like. We take a look at the NVMe drive in there just to see what the performance numbers are. And you'll see that the stock NVMe there, it's running at Gen 3 speeds, which is a maximum of 3,600 on your sequential reads and writes. And it's going to fall quite short on that with the rights being only 1300 This is a $239 mini PC. If you would like to spend $400 on an NVMe drive to stick into your $240 mini PC, you can do that if you want to. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So we're not looking at the best money you can buy. We're looking at the best you can buy for the money. You show me another mini PC at this price range that has these kind of specs, I'd love to see it because nothing comes close. As far as I can tell, Peladin stands alone in this value segment here, and this is how they're able to do it. And for most people outside of the benchmarks, they wouldn't know the difference. And if you would know the difference, you should be buying an $800 plus computer because your expectations in the way that you use your computer are not normal. When I say normal, they don't represent the majority of people. And this was designed for the majority of people. Again, it wasn't designed for you. So uh, it's really hard to determine what a viewer is thinking when they see this stuff. My goal is to convey what this is and what it represents and why it's worth talking about it. In a sea of mini PCs, why this one? Well. There is a uniqueness to this one that deserves attention, and that includes the color scheme, the ease of getting inside of it, the ability to upgrade it as easily as you can. Sometimes they solder RAM in on other machines to bring the price down, and then you can't upgrade it at all. 
Some machines are very large and have lots of fans or loud fans so that you can add more storage and more RAM and run a hotter CPU, but then people complain about the noise and the price. So no matter what a manufacturer does, there are viewers out there that say, if it's, if it's too inexpensive, then it's not good enough. And if it's too expensive, it's not good enough. And no matter what a manufacturer does for those people, it's not good enough. My advice to you is you build one of these, send me the parts list and show me how it adds up for under $240 with Windows 11 Pro, 512 gig Gen 3 NVMe, 16 gigs of DDR4, 3200 RAM, CPU, motherboard, processor, um, cooling fan, Wi-Fi adapter with Bluetooth, and put it on a case with a power supply. Go ahead, add it up. Show me what your price is. I challenge each and every one of you who think that is not the steal of the century to show me a better deal that you could put together yourself doesn't exist. You'd spend at least $500 to build that. So I realize I'm doing a lot of defense here because I'm anticipating the comments from certain people in my audience or certain viewers who come in and you know who you are. And I'm telling you, don't waste your time. If you leave a comment like that, I'm just going to remove it because it's not helpful to anybody. The idea here is that this is a computer that stands alone in its value proposition, its color scheme, it's easy to get into, the ability to upgrade it, which most consumers will never upgrade their computers. They just don't do it. They very rarely ever upgrade, update uh, their storage, their RAM, pretty much. They go to Best Buy, they go to Staples, they go to Walmart, they buy a box, they put the box down, they hook it up, and it stays that way until it doesn't work anymore. You know how I know? I'm a computer technician in this industry since 1991, and there is one trend that I have seen the entire time. And for the people who are very finicky, they don't call for service. They usually do service themselves. So I don't have a whole lot of interest in appealing to those enthusiasts because they're the people who I don't, my business does not exist <laughs> to enthusiasts. And I'm good with it that way. Enthusiasts are, if the world was filled with enthusiasts, I wouldn't have a business. So you can see why I might be a little bit uh, biased on this particular subject matter, because I've been able to earn a living for over 30 years by supplying a service, which is repair upgrades, builds to business clients and home users that have enabled me to stay self-employed for over three decades. And that is, that wouldn't be possible unless I had a lot of customers, potentially. If I only had a little tiny sliver of customers, they'd be very hard to come by and it'd be very hard to stay in business. So uh, nothing against the enthusiasts, but this is not an enthusiast channel. Uh, almost every other tech channel on YouTube is, and almost every article you will read is written by an enthusiast. Just know that. Understand the extremes that these folks will go to in both price, performance, temperature, uh, investment of time, because they love doing it so much. For the rest of us who don't love doing this, we want to be able to plug in a computer, just have the darn thing work, not have to call support, not have to deal with loud fans, not have to deal with you know, the thing being too slow to respond. This is a very respectable machine. But let me give you an example of what the enthusiasts are. And again, this isn't to slam on the enthusiasts, but this is to raise awareness. So you can see the difference. Motherboard manufacturers have been overvolting Intel and AMD chips in order to get higher benchmarks out of them. Those chips running hot are resulting in the chips lifespans being significantly declined, their efficiencies being lost, and the cost to run them goes up, the electricity cost goes up, the fan noise goes up, the cost to cool them goes up, reliability goes down and longevity goes down. Also, you can get a little higher in the benchmarks. Regular computer owners don't care about this stuff. It's not interesting to them. Not only that, those difference in benchmarks, they never see it. Even enthusiasts can't see it without some piece of software to tell them. So that's just a very different attitude. I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, but one is the majority and one is the minority. 
And if you went online, you'd think the minority was the majority, and they aren't. They're not even close. So, for example, if you look at this Peloton, one of the um, benchmarks that I test on it now would be Cinebench R23, which is a free download. You guys can test your own systems, whether it's something you've bought or something you've built. And this is an extreme test that does not in any way represent a normal, typical workload. But one of the things Cinebench 23 is going to do is it's going to peak your CPU power out based on the power settings your motherboard manufacturer has set to default. And right now, motherboard manufacturers are setting it 100 watts over Intel's recommended uh, limits. 100 watts over the limits is insanity. And it will definitely, definitely result in a shorter lifespan for your CPU and a much more expensive cooler in order to keep that running. So I wanted to know on these mini PCs, are these motherboard manufacturers overvolting their chips? So we run Prime 95 and find out, or not Prime 95, it takes 20 minutes. Let's run Cinebench R23 and we'll know quickly because you can run Cinebench R23 on your rig and the first thing it does is it wraps up your voltage maximum and you'll know within 30 seconds if you're going to have a problem. So if we go back over to our HDMI input and I go over to Cinebench R23, it's a portable program. I don't have to install it. All the things I run are portable. And then we'll go and run the application here. Now, one of the things people want to see when they rank that voltage up is a higher rating in Cinebench. Well, first of all, once we start Cinebench, Whoops, I shouldn't have started it. I needed to start uh, HW Info, which is another free download that will measure your temperatures. Let's run over there and grab that real quick. And I always choose sensors only. And again, this is all stuff you can do on the computer you're watching me on. But I should not have started Cinebench right now because now it's, it's utilizing every resource on the computer that it can to run this insanely unrealistic simulation of work. Let me see if I can <laughs> bring that back up to stop it. So we put this massive workload down on this machine. And if I don't started it in the right order, we wouldn't notice just how much of a workload this is put on. So what I have to do now is I have to wait a second while Cinebench is running and it will eventually give us uh, some resources back. <laughs> So we can start uh, HW Info. Um, if you're running Cinebench R23 and in 30 seconds your peak CPU temperature hits 100 degrees Celsius, you don't have a cooler problem necessarily. Your motherboard manufacturer has almost doubled the uh, wattage requirements recommended by the CPU manufacturer. And you have to go into your BIOS and change that and it's not easy. You have to be a bit technical. And I'll go over that in a future video where people can do that. Now, while Cinebench is running, close this and close this. Let's bring this out a little bit here so we can see what's happening temperature-wise. Now you can see we've got all our cores here and we have our current temperature and our minimum temperature. Let me just bring this over a little more. And this is our maximum temperature. This far right is our average. I don't care about the average. I'm mostly concerned about what our maximum is. And our minimum is the minimum since we started the hardware info software, which already had Cinebench running. And if I bring up uh, Cinebench, we can see that it's running, right? And it's been running for a few minutes. It's, it counts down from 10 minutes up here. And when we look at this, we can see the effect it has. If I, for example, go over here and hit stop, we should see those minimum temperatures. If you're curious, what does it run at idle? You'll notice these temperatures are gonna come down rather rapidly here uh, under a more normal, somewhere between 27 and 40 would be considered a normal idling temperature. If you're idling higher than 40, uh, you're probably not idling. You might be getting some updates in the background. Windows can be adjusting your swap file. Maybe your heatsink isn't attached correctly or you're blocking your fans. 
whether it's because you've never dusted the dust out of your computer and your fans are completely blocked up with dust, or because your fans are blowing out the top of the computer and you put a bunch of stuff on top of your computer, which is blocking your vents. I've seen people do all this stuff, right? So normally you'll see here, this is our normal idle, idle temperatures. And then if you watch, these temperatures are gonna shoot right up within the first 30 seconds of starting this. So I'll hit start and then hurry up and get back over here. And you'll see these temperatures are gonna jump up really high. And again, I encourage you to download the free portable version of HW Info, hardware info, and the free version of Cinebench R23. Run this test on your computer. And if you start to see these numbers hitting 100 degrees Celsius, and it'll save the high temp over here. Consider this your high scoreboard right here. If you're hitting anything over 90, I'd be concerned. And if you are, let us know in the comments after this video is live. And by knowing what, what uh, make and model of motherboard and CPU you have, we can tell you what the PL1 and PL2 settings are supposed to be. That's your, your low voltage to your high voltage, short-term high voltage and long-term regular voltage. Or you could Google that yourself, you know, the, the make and model of the CPU with recommended uh, wattage settings. In Intel's case, that's called PL1, power level one and power level two. And you can go into your BIOS and change your maximum and minimum power levels to match Intel specifications. And that problem goes away. You don't have to spend a lot of money on a cooler or a thermal compound or contact plates. All the other nonsense enthusiasts will buy, which is essentially to me a large waste of money to get, to lose efficiency, make the machine last less, you know, reduce its, overall longevity its lifespan will be significantly reduced and it'll cost more electricity to run it all so you can get just some higher numbers when you buy mini pcs overall you don't have this problem the manufacturers of mini pcs as you can see from our sample here they're not overvolting these chips now there might be a few out there that are doing it but i'm happy to report peladin is not so you're going to have a machine that's going to last a long time you're going to have a machine that runs quietly and you're going to have a machine that runs efficiently, meaning it's not going to cost a lot of money to run this machine and electricity cost, especially if you're someone who's very concerned about the environment that we live in and trying to go green as much as possible. You know, to turn around and put a 1400 KS in there is just like buying a, a 1960s muscle car and just dumping fuel in it to get really terrible gas mileage. There are people out there that don't care about the environment. <clears throat> they care about power and they'll throw a lot of money in it so they can get power back. I'm a value proposition guy. I'm looking to make sure my customers get the best bang for the buck. And in this category, this fits the majority of my customers' needs by probably 90% of my customers, maybe a little bit higher than that. If they had this computer, they'd be totally happy with it. In fact, they'd wonder why is it so cheap? They might be a little skeptical. There must be something wrong with it at that price. And after owning it, they would all come back and say, great value, sell me another one. Um, because they're so affordable, the idea of now just buying one computer and letting, you know, having to share it, now suddenly you can buy two. It still saved money if you had a $500 budget to buy a computer and you thought, well, I can just afford one. With this one, you could afford two and then you don't have to share it and you'd still have money left over. So. There's lots of good reasons for uh, machines at this level to exist. And the primary reason is because they sell more. The only reason this isn't selling more is people don't know it exists. And I'm here to help you guys be aware this product exists and it's a heck of a deal. Let me go back over to camera one here for a moment and let's take a look at your comments in the chat and see what you guys are talking about. If I missed anything or if you disagree with me about something I've said, we can have that debate. David Graham contributes $5. He says, my cousin and other family members use mini PCs for homework and to make money. For sure. All mini PCs have soldered CPUs, as do all laptops. As far as I know, um, we're not using desktop CPUs here. These are CPUs you cannot go on Newegg and buy. These are sold only to manufacturers. They are much smaller in size. They re reduce the amount of power they use. 
They also have mobile versions of the RTX 4060, 4070, 3070, 3080 that are less powerful than the desktop version and they're soldered on the board. That's how laptops, mini PCs, tablets, that's how they work. That's how they're able to get them so small and so low power to run off batteries forever. If you use the desktop CPU in here, you're, you would theoretically uh, need a cooler the size of the mini PC to keep it cool, number one. Number two, your power consumption would go up, and that would be a problem if you wanted a thin laptop with a long battery life. Wouldn't happen. So that's why there are separate laptop components that are very different from the desktop components, and that's why the part numbers have different names. Nick Poverman said he'd do a clean install on us because you never know what they did. Yeah, you know, there's certainly that, and doing a clean install would be no big deal. I've shown you guys how you can back up the drivers on your own. Before you begin, download your Windows 11 custom-made uh, USB installation media. I've shown you a video on how to do that. It's free, it's legal. And then just wipe it clean and reinstall it if you're that kind of personality where you don't trust anybody and you don't... Look... That's your thing, right? Most people, I'm telling you, you don't need to do that. But if you're of the personality where you, where you feel you need to, then by all means, if you want to do a bunch of work you don't need to do, then go for it. If that's what makes you happy, I won't tell you not to, and I won't tell you that, um, that, that there's anything wrong with it other than it's a complete waste of time. But if that's what it takes to satisfy you, it would take less time to just let you do that than to have the discussion with you. However, that could be true of any computer you buy pre-built, just so we put the facts out there. Just because you don't see this, just because there are icons on the desktop or not, has nothing to do with what the manufacturer may or may not have done. So if you're that personality and you're the kind of person that wants that kind of control, then anytime you buy a pre-built machine from anybody, you should always consider installing it yourself, wiping it clean and starting over. For everybody else, it's intended to be a, a ready to eat meal. You know, you take it out, you plug it in, you start using it, plug and play. That's what it's built to do. And if it fails in that, then the company has an issue, not you. So, but to each his own on that one. Um, running Ubuntu on this should not be a problem if you're a Linux user and you prefer to just use Linux. Uh, my understanding is it will run Ubuntu just fine. I'm not a Linux user. Again, I run a business. Linux users are not my customers. And I would not have a business if I service Linux customers. So I don't have any interest in Linux personally. However, if you do, and this is more of an experiment box for you, it is my understanding Ubuntu runs fine. Claudio says, I have a Morphine M8S mini PC and I love it. I use it to stream, I do some work, I convert some videos, and it works great for a 200 euro mini PC. That's what I'm saying. You know, be, if you're reasonable, you'll realize this is a bargain all day long. The only people who don't think that's a bargain are unreasonable and demanding people. So, and that's okay. There's no law against being unreasonable and demanding, but you don't represent the majority of the public that this was built for. That's all I'm trying to say. Dr. Bill says hello. Good to see you back here, Dr. Bill. I 
Ben Laird said he's lucky he doesn't pay electricity. It's included in his rent. Some people, Ben, especially where you live, where you've got the stop oil protesters, it has nothing to do with the money as it does have to do with the greenhouse gas emissions and trying to save the planet. And so there's a number of reasons why people want to lower power a computer, which isn't, I focus on cost because I'm a value oriented guy, but I also have to acknowledge there are the, the, uh, the folks that are very much into saving the planet that will do everything they can, not necessarily to save money, but to try and save the, what they believe is saving the planet. Then of course, you've got the noise issue and you've got the cost issue. You wanna go faster, it's gonna get louder and it's gonna get costlier. Not only is the unit itself gonna cost more for those more expensive parts, but the price per gigahertz value proposition gets lost the higher you go. You reach a point of diminishing returns where each, you reach a point where 100 megahertz more costs 100 to $200 more. And then when you divide that, if you take a processor and you say, okay, this processor's maximum um, uh, frequency is four gigahertz. And you take that four gigahertz and divide um, how much it costs by four gigahertz, and you can get your price per gigahertz. And you'll notice as you step up in power, your price per gigahertz goes up. So that same two gigahertz, like if this can go to four and the other one can go to five or six, they both do two. But the more expensive one doing two costs more just to pay for it, just to, just to own it significantly more. You have a calculator, it's called a computer. It's very easy for you to see how much you're paying per, say, 100 megahertz, or whatever ratio you wanna use, per gigahertz, per hertz, if you wanna do it that way. And you'll see you start, what you're getting for your money is, is a value somewhere around the middle. At the low end, it's not gonna last very long because it's probably a couple of years old model. We still see a lot of Intel um, J4125s. Just don't buy those. <laughs> Even a 5105. Yeah, they're going to be cheap because they're already two or three years old. You know, the N95, N100, et cetera, et cetera, more modern. But they're still going to be very limited as far as what you can do to upgrade them. The AMD is not limited in that way. So there's pros and cons no matter which way you look at it. But as you start spending more to get more, you're actually getting significantly less for the dollar the higher up you go. So that extra 100 megahertz is going to set you back, you know, $100 or more just for that little tiny, tiny little increase in peak performance, not regular normal performance, right? Your idle performance is likely going to be very, very similar, if not the same. But if you want to spend three times more for it, don't let me get in your way. But that is the behavior of enthusiasts. That's what enthusiasts do. Those are the videos enthusiasts make. And a lot of times the enthusiasts write the articles and they're always after what's the latest and greatest and have nothing to do with how practical it is. In most cases, they are extraordinarily impractical. And that's okay. It's just, I can't run a business being impractical. I would be out of business. Who would be buying from me? So. That's why I try to present to you information coming from a real world practical scenario that is much more realistic and more appealing to the vast majority of computer owners who might otherwise feel as though um, the stuff is way too complicated, it's way too expensive, it's over their head, and they're just not as good as everybody else. You know, that what they own is just junk. It's not true. That's what the enthusiasts allude to. They don't necessarily say it, but they're sort of alluding to, look how much better this is compared to whatever you have. Uh, they're not saying that, but it's easy to imply that from the videos. And sometimes the videos are nothing more than a commercial for the product versus an unbiased, let's just take a look at it and evaluate it without any influence coming from either side. Let's just look at it for what it is. Is this something that I would recommend to my clients? Yes, I have no issue uh, recommending this machine. At this price point, there's not a lot of risk for my business to take. When I sell a more expensive computer, there's more risk because client expectations are higher and any sort of issue becomes less tolerable. On a cheaper computer, if there's an issue, 
which I doubt there would be, but if there was an issue, people understand they paid, they got a good price on it. And so they're a little more in general understanding when things go a little sideways. So when I'm running a business, it's not just about making the sale. That customer is gonna call me for the life of that computer anytime there's a problem. And hopefully they'll call me when they want another one. And hopefully they'll recommend me to their friends. I don't do any advertising. All of my income and all of my business for over 30 years has been derived strictly from referrals. And you wouldn't get referrals if people weren't happy with the value they were getting and the service they were getting. So uh, there's been plenty of computer shops. They come and go. They, they on average last two to three years, two to three years. I'm sure you've seen computer shops in your neighborhood, wherever you live, that were once there that aren't there anymore. Why is that? Is it not easy? People in business want to make a lot of money. Customers want to save a lot of money. If you can find a customer that walks in and says, give me your best, and you can do that on a daily basis, you'll be running a business way more successful than mine. David Graham said you could buy four or more of these mini PCs for the cost of one desktop and do everything a desktop can do, even AA gaming at 1080p. Chapa wants to know if the, the pallet in cases is plastic or metal. This is um, plastic. It's all plastic. Yeah, it's all plastic. I imagine if you wanted a metal case for another $75, they could probably do that. Remember, you've got to adjust your expectations for what you're paying for it. There's no doubt in my mind if that was an all metal case, that price would have to be up. And I don't know what benefit you would have to a metal case. It, it's, it's not a jack stand for a car. So I would prefer personally the plastic because it's lighter weight. Nick Caffrey wants to know, what would be the tilt point of deciding between a Paladin and a PC if you're not a gamer? Well, I suppose it's like, if you're somebody who likes to get into a computer a lot, if you want to be able to add different cards, like I have a four port capture card inside of this machine. And if I really want to use that four port capture card, it's never going to fit in a mini PC. First of all, the card is bigger than the PC. And secondly, there's no PCIe slots in here for me to use. And that's true of any PCIe uh, slot add-in that you might want to use. It could be an audio card, something like that. However, they do make USB capture cards. So this could very well replace that for doing what I'm doing with just a USB capture card and an HDMI switcher. I could do the exact same thing. So the idea that you could take the motherboard out, change the motherboard, keep the case, keep the power supply, you're not gonna do that with this. This is more disposable as are most pre-built computers are disposable. Most are not very repairable, especially if they're made by Apple, but that's a story from another, another day. If you're a gamer and you wanna stay on top of the latest, uh, well, you said you're not a gamer, but you know to have a graphics card in there for AutoCAD work or you know, um, engineering type work, you probably need the power of a workstation that a mini PC could do, but it would do it too slowly for you. So uh, then there's just personal preference, right? Is there some reason I should choose a cloth couch over a leather couch? It's really your personal preference. You might be somebody who doesn't like leather or doesn't like the idea behind leather, but then they have fake leather, but then you might think fake leather quality is not that good. And then they have fabric, but then fabric can stain. So you might be worried about that and tearing. There's no right or wrong answer as we talk about, should I order the chicken or should I order the steak when we're at a restaurant? It's like you're asking me that question. And it's a question nobody but you can answer. Fortunately, because you can ask a question doesn't mean it can be answered. Other than to say, it is your decision for you to make. I try to advise my clients the pros and cons of each of their concerns and then say, which way would you like to go? And I don't, I don't drive them to any particular response. I go, here's what the steak meal comes with and how much it costs. Here's what the chicken meal comes with and how much it costs. Do you have any other questions or concerns? And which would you like to order the chicken or the steak? 
it doesn't make a difference to me as the cook. I don't care if I'm cooking the chicken or the steak. It's the same amount of work. I'm still plating food one way or the other. It's really up to the, so if somebody says, well, I don't know what I want. Like, you know, let me know when you're ready. I'm not going to sit there and spend all day with a customer who can't make up their mind. You take as much time as you need. And when you're ready, give me a call. I'll be around ready whenever you are. So I appreciate the question, though, even if it's a question I can't necessarily answer. Thomas Magti says he likes the new glasses. Ah, he noticed. I have mail. Oh, I should check my email. Thank you for reminding me. That's from Chapa. Let's see, do I have mail? Stuart sent $6.25 via PayPal. Right on. Thank you, Stuart. Did I miss anything else? Where's my where'd my email go? Thomas MacT with a gift card of $25. Thank you, he says. Hey, I finally found the link to send you an Amazon gift card. You're an upstanding man who does great things for anyone who's respectful to all. I've been a longtime watcher and a member for one and a half years. I've had this account for a long time. That's Thomas Mac T. Well, thank you, Thomas. I appreciate your support and your kind words. I think that catches us up there. Now, with regards to the voltage, the, the whole wattage, and uh, I'm going to be covering that. I did a members-only video demonstrating it. And I was going to edit that, publish it. But as I started editing it, I realized this isn't clear enough for me. So I've ordered uh, an MSI motherboard, an ASRock motherboard, a Gigabyte motherboard, and an ASUS motherboard. And I'm going to show you how every single one of them, out of the box, by default, without your consent or permission, over, it overvolts your CPU. There's a number of videos out there that will tell you how to address it, and none of them I agree with. So I'm going to show you the, the engineering way that I would do it. And it wouldn't be to undervolt the CPU. It wouldn't be to run the Intel Extreme Utility, the, 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 the tuning utility. You go into the BIOS. You find where your PL1 and PL2 settings are, and it's in a different place. I know some boards say, you know, return back to the Intel power limits, but they don't. You turn that on and go back and run uh, R23 Cinebench, and they'll peak to 100 degrees Celsius again. Because even when you tell them to enforce the Intel power limits, they still don't do it. So even being told that's the solution, it's not the solution, according to me. So what you do is you look up the chip you've got, and you say to Google, what are the PL1, PL2 settings of my 13500 CPU? Or 13500K, right? They're very different. You put the exact model of CPU in, it'll tell you PL1 limit is this and the PL2 limit is that. You go into your BIOS, you find those numbers and you change them back to the Intel specifications. All your problems go away, you're done. There's no more fooling around with it. Why it doesn't come that way out of the box, you can thank the reviewers for. Because by cooking your CPU, they're getting higher benchmark numbers and they're falsely concluding because of how smart they think they are, that that's a better product. When all the manufacturers did is fool them. Manufacturers are saying, you think you're smart, huh? Watch this, hold my beer. And so the manufacturers are making all these folks look like idiots because they're evaluating the performance of something that's being run outside of manufacturer specifications without fully realizing it. And then they say, well, this is the better product because it ran better at the benchmarks. And so that, that company can sell more motherboards. It is the most ridiculous thing. And it's making a lot of these so-called people that are you know, self-proclaimed techs look like complete fools. It's made me look like a complete fool. And believe me, I'm upset about it because it starts, it starts with, hey, these numbers look great. And it ends with, why is everything running so hot? This is now the third cooler I've put out. How many times have I said this? I put the third cooler on this thing 
These coolers are $100 to $200 a piece, but it's still not solving it. What about this contact plate? You know, maybe this contact frame. Contact frame isn't going to do much. It just isn't going to do much. So if you want to waste your money and throw coolers at it all day, I mean, you know, you go right ahead and join the rest of the sheep. But for those of us who want to understand why this is happening and stop it without necessarily having to spend one penny, I'm going to show you how to do that here. Next week, when, I, when the boards arrive, we'll go through each board and I'm going to show you exactly how it's done. And then you just have to determine how your board and your CPU are different, but apply what I teach you. And you won't have to worry about buying expensive coolers or messing with any extreme tuning software or undervolting your CPU and all this other nonsense that people say online, which, you know, might get you there. But I, why not just run the CPU the way the manufacturer intended it for, for it to be run? And all these problems go away. And you can see Peladin is doing that here. And I have a great amount of respect for them for not overvolting this and for keeping it at manufacturer specs. In some cases, many PCs actually run under the manufacturer specs. In some mini PCs, and maybe even this one, you can go into the BIOS and you can up the voltage higher by another 10 watts. But the reason they don't do that is in order to make the machine last longer and run quieter and use less power and be more efficient. The minute you start cranking the wattage up, you lose your efficiency, your noise levels go up. Why would you want to do that? But that's exactly what all the motherboard manufacturers, Asus, ASRock, Gigabyte, and MSI, they're all doing it across the board. And this started about somewhere around 12th gen, I want to say this started, because I have an 11th gen and a 9th gen board that don't do this. So as far as I can tell, this is something they started around two years ago, and it's not good. I don't mind if they want to offer that as a feature a technical person can enable, but out of the box, having it run that way is unacceptable, and figuring out how to put it back to specs, you've got to be technical and know how to do that. And I will do my best to, to make that as painless as possible to show you what to look for, because depending on the chip and the motherboard you've got, it will be different but there will be a consistency by showing you all four makes. You'll, you'll notice what I'm looking for, so you know what to look for. And I'm so glad we don't have to do that with these. <laughs> it's such a stupid and unnecessary step, but almost completely necessary that you don't let it run out of the box the way they've set it up, unless you only plan on owning the computer for two or three years, in which case, you know, burn it up. Burn them up. So that'll be next week. I'm just waiting for the boards to come in. And I'm, I don't have any use for these boards other than to demonstrate this. It's the only reason I've taken your gift card money and I've reinvested into the channel to make unique content you won't find anywhere else with a unique take coming from a computer, real working computer technician, so I can show you how I run a business and how I deal with these kind of customer problems so that you don't have to call somebody like me to service your computer. I want to give you back control of your machine and help you understand why these problems you're having, you're having. Someone reached out to me the other day and said, could I buy a Windows 10 Pro key to, act to change my Windows 11 home into a Windows 11 Pro? No, no, you can't. But why do you want to go to Windows 11 Pro? Well, uh, my Windows update's not working. And, and I'm like, okay, but that's a problem with Windows update. That has nothing to do with Windows 11 home or Pro. Their thought was, if I upgrade to Pro, then that'll fix the problem. No, not likely. You're just wasting your time and your money. Someone else said, I noticed you're installing Windows 11 on all your new builds. Does that mean it's time for me to install Windows 11 on my computer that's running Windows 10? I said, why do you want to do that? Well, because I see you doing it. Okay, but <laughs> if I have to put a brand new operating system on a brand new computer, it might as well be Windows 11. But if you've already got a computer with Windows 10 on it, you've got until the mid-October of 2025. You've got a year and a half. What's your panic? Is there something Windows 11 is going to do for you that you can't do with Windows 10? And they usually they go, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. It's like, if you have to ask me, then you've already answered your own question. So if you want to put Windows 11 on it, go for it. But you don't need to. You're not going to see any benefit from it. Furthermore, um, you know, you're going to spend money, and if it doesn't go well, you could just bork the whole thing. You could take a perfectly great working machine and completely ruin it 
because everything was just working too well and you couldn't leave it alone. Hey, that's your own machine. If you want to do it, go for it. I'm not a salesman. I'm not here to try and sell you this stuff. I'm just telling you, be prepared. If you start messing with it, things are more likely to go wrong than if you leave it alone. Now, if the reason you're messing with it is you're going to be able to get some benefit from it when you're done, I'm all for it. If the risk outweighs the reward, don't do it. But if the risk is worth the reward, but my question is, what's your reward? And they're like, well, you tell me. I'm like, I can't tell you. There, as far as I can tell, there is no reward for you. There's a reward for Microsoft that they can claim more Windows 11 market share. Of course, Microsoft wants to raise the Windows 11 market share. But what does that do for you? If you're just in the mood to do it because you're bored, you have nothing better to do and you want to learn Windows 11, then you didn't need to ask me that question to begin with. You've already made up your mind. Have at it. I don't see any reason why you should do it, and I don't see any reason why you shouldn't. But I, I also know that if you've got a working computer that doesn't have any problems, leave it alone. And if your computer does have a problem, you should reach out for help rather than thinking a reinstall or an upgrade of your operating system has anything at all to do with the problem you're having is a big, big mistake in logic. That's not how we fix things. And very rarely does that ever work. So uh, we're here to help you. If you have any actual, not imaginary, not hypothetical, but if you have an actual problem with your computer, we have a great chat room as well as in the comment section where you can tell us about the problem you're having and ask us for assistance on how to resolve that. And between myself and this amazing community, you will likely be led to the answer you're looking for, which is likely nothing you would ever come up with on your own, which is why you're asking. Rather than just throwing darts at the wall going, I wonder what would happen if I threw a bunch of parts at this thing like, it, like they were darts. Uh, if I had a cannon of parts and I was just shooting parts at it until I fixed it, throwing different operating systems. On. That's not how we fix things. It's not how a professional does it, or we wouldn't get any work done and our customers would be pissed off that they're waiting so long to have it done. So take advantage of the brain trust here. And you know, if you have any real actual computer problems, we can help you with those guaranteed versus you just guessing. We're here to help you. But if you have what if scenarios and anxiety, that's more doctor related, that's not tech related. And so we can't help you with the what ifs, but with reality, we can absolutely help you. Luke Greenia says he's got an Ace Magic uh, CK10 mini PC and he's had it for some time and have nothing but great things to say about it. Chapa wants to know if overvolting happens with laptops. I don't know. I don't see very many laptops here. It's something you'd have to check on your own and I've shown you how you can check it. Are mini PCs the future? Well, again, I, I, I can't answer speculative hypothetical questions, so who knows? Uh, let's see. PC Fishing says, when I was an enthusiast back in the 90s, I overclocked my CPU and found no benefit. During that time, I didn't look into videos on overclocking. Were there any videos on overclocking? I mean, YouTube didn't exist until 2005, so I'm not quite sure where you would have found videos. Tim Teal says, hello, Carrie and chat. Thank you for another great video and a new mini PC I can recommend to my clients. He's been using Camrui mini PCs that have been great. And Douglas Burchell, who received a giveaway from us, the AWOW PC, with many thanks to our friend Peter Laycock, or Buster, who made that giveaway possible. Douglas Burchell is the recipient who says that AWOL mini PC is still going strong and thank you. Thank you to Carrie and Buster. Right, well, it's our pleasure. We're certainly glad, certainly glad that you are enjoying it. And it just goes to show you, a big difference in these mini PCs is going to be um, not only your choice of RAM, or rather the manufacturer's choice of RAM, how much of it you're getting, whether or not it's soldered on, what type of NVMe drive they're using, if it's got a second M.2 or not, how many watts it's going to draw, how much power it needs. Some of them are USB-C powered, if that's important to you. Clearly, this one doesn't do that. But the USB-C powered ones will usually be no more than 65 watts total. So in theory, I think this one could have been USB-C powered. 
I don't know how important that is to people though. If you buy a monitor with USB-C power output, in theory, you could run just one cable, which I've demonstrated here with another mini PC, straight from your monitor right into the PC, and that powers the PC and delivers the video. Now, sorry, I had to step away to sneeze. Now, the, um, the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth on this are great. Some are going to be older models with older Wi-Fi and older Bluetooth, and that's usually reflected in a price. So I think when you consider exactly what this is coming with at this price point, I'm not aware of any competitor to compare this with fairly, because it seems to me that those competitors are running older chips or older Wi-Fi or older Bluetooth or less RAM or slower NVMe or soldered on RAM. So I really feel like this is a great value. On top of, you know, not having to struggle with any screws, the fact that this lid is uh, magnetic. I don't agree that about putting a two and a half inch drive in here. I think that should be removed. I'm afraid that if you put a two and a half inch drive in there, there's no ventilation. There's, you've got holes for air, but you have no fans. So in this whole section, you'll notice there's nowhere for the air. It's, there's no fan moving the air is what I mean to say. So all you're doing is adding more heat into a tiny little box, which is great if you want an easy bake oven. But if you want a mini PC and you need more storage, I would consider a USB external storage, which would be about as fast as the NVMe that's in here anyway. Right? You've seen me using the SSD SanDisk Extreme USBs. Those are easily 1,000 megabytes per second on reads and writes going through that USB-C port. So if the cost isn't really any different, why not have the versatility of having it external and reduce the heat? But, you know, that's just my opinion on it. If I had to find something to complain about, and I will, the lack of a USB-C port and the idea that they enable you to put a two and a half inch drive in there, I don't think that should be there. That should be a feature that was removed. Isn't that weird? You think, isn't it adding value by giving you more choice? I'm afraid the choice you make may be to your own demise by putting more heat into it. What you thought you did to upgrade it, you actually downgraded it with regards to its ability to perform because it's going to heat up the RAM, it's going to heat up the NVMe, and it's going to slow the whole system down potentially, depending on what drive you put in there and just how much airflow. You know, now, if there was a fan in there pushing air around, or maybe you stuck a fan off to the side to push air through it, that seems really, really hokey and you know, real garage, weekend garage mechanic kind of stuff. I wouldn't advise a customer. I would, it wouldn't be professional to do that. Which isn't to say you shouldn't. I shouldn't. Douglas Burchell said he added an external Samsung one terabyte drive. That's the way to do it, I'm telling you. All right, I think we'll wrap it up a little early today. This is an easy review. And one more time, I want to take another look at the Amazon page, which shows, uh, where's my mouse? There it is. Right here at Amazon, $239.99. Look at everything you're getting for the money. Try and piece together a similar system and tell me how much money it's going to cost you to match the specs. It'll be a lot more than $240. 30-day returns, completely free, for any reason. Maybe you just changed your mind. That's okay with Amazon. If you want to return it, you have 30 days to evaluate it and return it for any reason. There is no risk here at all to you. You're asking me if you're going to like something, and I don't know you, and I don't know what you like. The only way you're going to know if you like it, the only way that anybody can answer your question is you having it in your hands so you can decide for yourself. And should you order one and evaluate it for yourself, 
whether you decide to keep it or send it back, we'd love to hear your experience in our comment section. That'll help other viewers get another perspective besides mine, and they might relate to your perspective more than they relate to mine, whether you like it or you don't like it. But you have to tell us. We can't tell you. That's where you have to tell us what your preferences are, what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. Anything about your experience that you can share with us would be beneficial to the entire community. I'm just telling you what to expect. But whether or not that meets your expectations, I have no idea. Anyway, I think it's a great value. And, you know, there's plenty of other mini PCs at $300 and above. And I think it's, a, it's pretty unique in where it's sitting for power and for price. It's a great value proposition. Does support 4K resolution, in case you were wondering. And we have uh, some buyers here that have all universally loved this machine. This person received a free product, and that one received a free product. And that one received a free product. All right, we've got one maybe real review. So if you experience it, if you decide to buy one, share your review on Amazon as well, because that will also help the community to be able to have more variety of perspectives in the review section. So together we can help each other out. All right, I think that's going to wrap it up for today, unless there's any questions. I think tomorrow, so we will be live, of course, Friday at 1 o'clock Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern. And I think the plan is to cover that Windows 10 uh, KB, whatever it is, ends in 4441, 503-4441, that's failing for everybody. The advice overall is to leave it alone. Microsoft will fix it. Well, it's been three months and Microsoft hasn't fixed it. And if you're tired of looking at it, I'm going to show you an easy way that you can fix it yourself. Even though I myself said, don't even bother trying, it's complicated. <sighs> for some of you, it won't be that difficult. And for others, it'll be slightly difficult. And for others, it'll be extraordinarily difficult. And for others, it won't be possible. And the, because of the different outcomes, I can understand why Microsoft has not come up with a fix for this yet. It's not... It's not a simple fix. I will say, for some people, it is a simple fix. And probably for most people, and I'm going to show that to you tomorrow, and then you can decide if you want to do it. Some people suspect Microsoft is doing it on purpose to give you a reason to go to Windows 11. <laughs> for some reason, this update does not exist on Windows 11, because if it did, you'd likely have the same problem, as far as I can tell. So this seems uh, to be a unique problem with Windows 10 that Microsoft seems to be dragging their feet on or it's such a complicated fix that they haven't really come up with a way to address the four different possibilities of why it's not loading or why it's failing without potentially borking your system in the process. So, and it's such a bizarre thing that it's fixing. It's for people who use BitLocker that are afraid somebody who has access, physical access to the computer inside the building could bypass your BitLocker. So if you don't use BitLocker and you don't have somebody who's trying to get into your computer in the building where your computer is, then this update has no value to you at all. Most updates are really important, but this one's questionable at best. However, if you're like me and you just don't like to see this update coming back over and over, failing and failing and failing for three months, and you don't want to hide it because if you hide it, what happens if there's a fix and now it doesn't show you the fix? This fix will likely fix it for 80% of you. There'll be 20% of you this fix won't fix it for. 
or there's a subfix that might fix it, and then a sub subfix, and then a sub sub subfix. And each one of those is less likely, but I guarantee there'll be a small percentage of you that no matter what you do, you cannot address it. But the vast majority of you will be able to, to fix this, and you'll say that really wasn't that hard. But understand that's because your PC was set up correctly. Microsoft can't simply make that assumption. So by by forcing this down everybody's throat, you could be borking a, a significant portion of Windows 10 owners' uh, system stabilities. And so I prefer Microsoft was cautious, but I also prefer that maybe Microsoft checked to see if BitLocker was turned on before, before even offering you the update. Just as a pre-qualifier, if you're not using BitLocker, why offer this update to BitLocker? It makes no sense to me. That's how Microsoft should have done it. But what do I know? I'm just a computer repair technician with over 30 years of experience. I don't work in a big corporation filled with politics and drama. And, you know, the last thing you want to do is make your boss look stupid because then you won't be employed there very long. So, welcome to the complexities of corporate America, politics, investors, and, uh, Demanding customers. Fun all the way around. Yellowstone TV said his Windows 10 laptop took the update fine. Yeah, I certainly did not mean to imply that the update fails on all Windows 10 updates. Uh, did I say that the update fails on all Windows 10? No, I don't think that's what I said. So, yeah, please, please do... Carefully, if you want any of the repair advice I give you to work, you, you have to listen to the words I say and not to the words I didn't say, if you want it to work. So um, some Windows 10 computers obviously um, are, are accepting that update. Um, I haven't seen any actually take the update. Every computer from every client is failing. So and from my perspective, 100%. But there are, I mean, I've heard, I've not seen it, but I've heard there are some Windows 10 installs where that update works. But they're few and far between. They don't represent the majority. This is, uh, this is not good. Carrie, have you heard from Mitch? Mitch is doing well. Thanks for asking. And Peter VZ with a one euro contribution in Super Chat. Thank you for that. Luke Greeny has said both of his Windows 10 machines failed that update. Patrick Manny said resizing partitions is not for everyone. There is a, uh, there's a fix for this where you don't have to do that. It does it for you in a PowerShell script. And it's amazingly effective. And I'll go over that tomorrow. So, yeah, don't make assumptions. Wait till you see what I've got coming. And that will wrap it up for me for today. Thank you guys so much for your contributions and your support. And I appreciate your questions and interaction in the chat room. And uh, I'd love to hear from anybody who ends up buying one of these, what your thoughts are on it. And, you know, that way people know that I'm, well, that'll help them determine if I'm unbiased or not by hearing what other people have to say. I would love to hear your opinion on it personally. I think Peladin is offering a great value based on their market position. They want to be better known. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to give you better value, better value for your money. But if nobody knows they exist, how are you going to make any sales? So we're here to just introduce them to you. At the end of the day, it's up to you to decide if it's something you want to purchase or try. But with the Windows 30, uh, with the Amazon 30 day money back uh, free return guarantee, there's really no risk here to you, at least here in the United States. So yeah, if, if you, uh, Take that leap. I'd love to hear your experience. That'll wrap it up for me for today. Thank you, of course, to Mara for the great work she did on today's thumbnail. And of course, the video notes where we have links and description and everything in the video notes below the video. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. And thanks again to our friends at Acronis, PC backup software, Instant House Call, remote PC repair software, RoboForm, password manager software, and of course, VIP CDK deals where you can buy legal, legitimate Windows and Microsoft Office product keys 
for 90% off the retail price. And guaranteed, everything is guaranteed for your money back. Guaranteed. It works. All right, I will see you all again tomorrow. I hope you'll join me at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern. Until then, bye for now.